Hey, and welcome back to the channel. We're really excited you're here. This is the premiere episode of Incident Command Simplified. In this series, we're gonna take a real hard, honest look at some of the things about the Incident Command system that people don't like, some of the reasons that people don't use it. We're gonna break it down, help you understand so that you can use it better in the field to make you more successful. We'll be right back. We've gotten lots of questions over the years uh, from folks who have taken a class, maybe ICS 100, 200, 300, 400, uh, maybe they've taken something else, maybe they've been on an incident where they've heard terms, things like that. Uh, so we, we get a lot of questions and we wanted to, to bring you some of that information in a series. Uh, and so in this series, what we're going to do, it's going to be very modular in nature and we're going to have it where you can kind of cherry pick any of the, the episodes that you want. So if there's one specific thing that you wanna hear about, maybe one position, a specific job like logistics or operations or safety, you'll be able to cherry pick those, but we'll also have the series set up uh, in, a, in a very uh, linear style where it starts at the, at the beginning, of course, uh, and then it works as building blocks through the entire incident command system process uh, so that it, it, one episode builds on the other and that we understand uh, the, the system as a whole once we're done. Now don't be scared, uh, our channel name is Hazmat Ops Training. So some of you that say, hey, Hazmat, nope, I'm out. Don't, don't click off. Uh, yes, we are a Hazmat channel. We are Hazmat professionals, been in that business for a very, very long time. But we've also been in the incident management business. We're emergency managers. Uh, so, and all of our contributors and our staff. Uh, so we want to bring some of that background to you as well. So again, don't be scared off by the hazmat piece. And also our hazmat subscribers, uh, our hazmat viewers, don't be scared either. We're going to continue our hazmat content as well. So stick with us on that. So again, what we want to do is break down some of that stigma that the ICS system has in that it is so large. Uh, so when we take a, a, an ICS class, 100 and 200, uh, maybe an online class. Um, not the best, in, in my opinion, uh, not the best format uh, for that type of training. A lot of times people are going to click through as quick as they can just to get it done, get it behind me because the chief said I had to have it. It's not, that's not teaching us anything. And then we may move on to three and 400 or we may move on to some other sort of training. And if we're not truly invested in what the system can do for us, it can be so overwhelming. So we wanna make sure that we break down those pieces. It's just like eating an elephant. You gotta eat it one bite at a time. You can't comprehend, you can't absorb all the information about the incident command system in one setting, in one class, in one delivery. We'll also have uh, things that will work for you every day. Um, even in this big system, in this large uh, system uh, called the Incident Command System within the National Incident Management System, there are things that we can take for everyday use. It's not just those large disasters. There's things that we can use for our everyday response. And here's the thing. If we don't have a system, then we're just winging it. We're going off of prior experience. That prior experience may not be the best experience uh, when it comes to good management of an incident, especially an incident that's large or that's complex. It doesn't necessarily have to be large in scale in, in size. It can be large in complexity. It can be a lot of moving parts and not such a, a huge footprint. Um, that, that can be a difficult incident to manage as well. But we've got to have a system. If you've never listened to Gordon Graham, just put Gordon Graham right in the, in the YouTube search there. Um, he does an amazing um, risk management type of, of delivery. Uh, he's got one video on there. It was made back in the late 80s, early 90s. It's a little bit dated, but the message is still spot on. I would highly suggest uh, that you that you watch that. I've, I've listened to it dozens and dozens of times. I get something new out of it every time. We're not an affiliate with Gordon. I just really respect um, his approach. And he talks about having a system. You've got to have a system or you're doomed to fail. Or, or at least you're doomed to not to be as successful as you possibly can. Systems work. 
So in February of 2003, the Homeland Security Presidential Directive number five uh, was signed. This mandated the National Incident Management System, what we call NIMS. The Incident Command System is a part of that. The Incident Command System was kind of adopted from a very military management style. Uh, and also here in the United States, our partners in the wildfire side of, of the house have perfected this for all hazard, not just wildfire, but for all hazard types of response. Uh, so if you have anyone in the forestry business uh, around you, and most of us do, uh, whether that be a county ranger, whether they be uh, you know regional type folks, in the United States, those folks do incident management better than anybody else. Why? because they do it all the time. And they do it on a very, very large scale all the time. Wildfire season, it's gotten to where wildfire season almost never ends. So these folks travel all around the country and they get a lot of practice. That's a great resource, be thinking about that. We'll mention that again as we go through the series. But we wanna think about this, we don't wanna use the incident command system because we're mandated. We wanna use, and that's obviously a reason to use it, but we wanna use it because it works, it's good. Um, it's, it's a very tried and true system um, and it's universal. It is the national rec nationally recognized system for incident management here in the United States. But let's get back to why folks don't often buy in to the incident command system. One big thing is the way that we do the training. And I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of, I'm going to beat us up a little bit in talking about the way that we deliver training. Most folks now, uh, we'll take ICS 100 and 200 online. Um, there's a place for online training, but I don't think this is the, the best way for responders to be introduced to the National Incident Management System and specifically the Incident Command System. Uh, I think there's something to be said for in-person training when we're talking about this type of thing. But be that as it may, uh, we, we do have uh, a lot of folks that are taking that, that training online. So they, they come out of it with a, a basic knowledge and really what they can comprehend uh, from, from that online format. And then traditionally, we'll see the ICS 3 and 400 classes come behind that. Uh, typically, first line supervisors in, in just about any of our emergency services, typically first line supervisors and above are, are who are required to take ICS 3 and 400 class. Quite frankly, um, it's death by PowerPoint for most people. Unless you are seriously invested and super interested, um, most folks uh, go into the ICS 3 and 400 class uh, thinking about when we're gonna get out. Uh, when, how long does this take? When's it gonna be over? Unless you've got a super duper instructor, uh, it, it's, it's a tough class. Uh, however, um, it's one of those things that you'll only get out as much as you put in. So you as the student, you've got to be invested in, in what we're talking about. Just like with this series, you, you've clicked here, you're already here, you're with us. You obviously have, have some investment in what we're talking about. Uh, so that's the same thing with, with those in-person classes or the online classes is you've got to be invested. You've got to be interested. So many of our, our, our folks uh, just, they're there because they have to. The chief said I had to take this class. Uh, I just want to get out of here. And that's what I really want to impress upon you the most is buy into this. Get your arms around, get your mind around the incident command system. Learn it and get as much out of it as you possibly can. It will make you a better responder. It'll make you a better manager. It'll make you a better incident commander. Whatever your position is within the ICS structure, it will make you better the more you learn. Another thing about the 300 and 400 classes, and, and this is, you know, I, again, I, I said I was gonna beat us up a little bit. I'm not beating up FEMA for their format and for their delivery, but the 300 and 400 classes, they really only scratch the surface. And again, you've gotta have a really strong instructor that can, can give the student exactly what they need and really hone in on what that student needs or else they're just gonna get the tip of the iceberg. So we've gotta make sure that we're really getting the student interested, getting the student invested. A lot of folks come out of the three and 400 classes and they think, it sounds like a lot of paperwork and a lot of meetings to me. And it is, it is a lot of paperwork and it is a lot of meetings but they have their meaning, they have their place. 
there this system works pure and simple so again in the series that's what we're going to talk about what are those meetings about what's the productive piece what's what's the product that's produced uh, when we're we're attending those meetings what are the things that we're accomplishing there the incident action plan what, what does it do what does it accomplish what does it give me as a responder so some things that I really want to impress upon you uh, for what you need to be successful here. Again, we talked about training. You've got to have trained people. Your folks have to understand what they're doing. But having said that, we've got to have people. And some of you may be saying, hang on, I, I, don't, I don't have enough people to even run my volunteer fire department. I don't have enough people on my roster, whether you're paid, volunteer, whatever the case may be, we can barely get by and, and staff an incident uh, to, to the minimum requirement. Uh, understandably so, I, I get that. You don't have people to spare, but you've got partners in the business. You've got other departments uh, that are, are neighboring to you, maybe in your county, maybe in neighboring counties. So you have to be thinking a little bit outside the box, not just your agency, but think a little bit outside the box and how if you start to grow in some capability and you start to build some capability, train people, get them on board with some of the things that we're talking about here and position specific type things that can be done on an incident to make that incident smoother, we can begin to look outside the box, begin to look at those partnerships and when we have these larger incidents, we bring those people in. We've gotta be thinking about what's a trigger point for our larger incidents where we, we're gonna call in our partners from other jurisdictions to build that incident management team. We'll talk about that uh, again in the series as we go, but building a system within our existing system and tapping into those outside resources. Again, back to training. We've got to look at other than the 300 and 400 classes. We've got to look at position specific type training, operations section chief, incident commander type training, safety officer training, logistics section chief training, planning section chief, those kinds of things. All of those jobs are critical to the, the, the success for these larger incidents. But you've got to have folks trained. Do they necessarily have to be credentialed? Do they have to have some sort of badge that says, no, not for a local incident management team, not for a local incident management type of system. You the authority having jurisdiction, you decide what level your folks, this is internal to you. This is internal to your local partners. So you decide as the authority having jurisdiction, what level you want to be at. Can you get credentialed? Sure you can. Can you be a regional responder, a state level responder, even a national level responder? Sure you can. You can take this as far as you want to, but the basis has to start local. Let's look at the local capability. Let's look at making ourselves successful locally, being strong locally, and then we'll, we'll spread out. We'll talk about that throughout the series as we go, but this is looking at how we make our incidents that we're responding to more successful, more efficient through solid training and qualification for some of these positions. And then the last thing, not, not the last thing, but the, the last thing that we'll talk about in this particular episode um, is you've got to have a basic set of tools. Uh, it's just like any other incident that we respond to. Medical incident, you got to have your medical supplies. you got to have your medical tools. Fire incident, you got to have your tools. Law enforcement, they have their tools. So this is the same thing. With incident management, you got to have a basic set of tools. Um, and a lot of it comes back to paperwork. A lot of it comes back to organizational type tools that will help us for this incident management process. And we'll talk about those as we go, but I wanna, put, I wanna get you thinking about those things. And one that I feel like is, is the basis for this process is the planning P. And the, the planning section, specifically the planning section chief, is really kind of the, the, the hinge, kind of the, the hub uh, for the wheel of this whole thing. I, I've kind of got a personal uh, saying of my own, all roads lead to planning. Uh, and planning, the planning section has a role in just about everything that goes on. That doesn't mean the planning section chief is running things. That doesn't mean that the planning section chief is, is dictating what the incident commander does. It doesn't say that at all. It's saying that that 
planning piece, that planning function, and specifically the planning P, which is kind of our clock, is kind of our roadmap for that success and for the, the flow of the incident, that planning P is critical. The other thing is span of control. Uh, it's very, very easy to lose span of control, and it's also easy to lose situational awareness. Now, a lot of people use situational awareness almost in the emergency services as a, as a little bit of a cliche, but we need to make sure that we understand what situational awareness is and enlist people to help us maintain that situational awareness. A smart incident commander will enlist people for this resource piece, for this situational piece, make sure that we have the accountability, make sure that we have that span of control is maintained, make sure that we truly understand where our incident is and where it's going. I talked about accountability. I'm not only talking about personnel accountability, but also fiscal, not physical, but fiscal accountability. The money that we're spending, keeping up with that money, looking at what things cost, choosing the best resource for the money. Again, we're talking about these large incidents um, and a lot of times it takes a team to come in and help you with that, but that's another piece of accountability that oftentimes we don't think about. The logistical piece, the larger your incident becomes, the more responders you have on the scene, the bigger that tactical resource complement becomes, the larger the logistical complement must become as well. There's Again, there's kind of a saying in the, in the logistics community, uh, is it's all a dream without logistics. You can have the best plan in the world, but it's nothing but a dream unless the logistics are there to support it. A big piece that we'll talk about here is safety. Um, and I, talk, I told you plans is, is one of the, the big things that I really feel like is, is a, a, a hinge, for, a hub for the entire system. Um, I'm, I'm a credentialed type three plans chief and I'm also a credentialed type three safety officer. So that's another one that I'm gonna hit on really hard because those are the two that I feel like are absolutely critical. The other pieces and parts critical as well. Yes, they are, but safety, and the planning side are absolutely critical. I, and I, I really feel strongly about those. That's why I'm credentialed in those areas. Also information flow and information sharing. And this is both internal to the incident and external to the incident. How do we manage information flow to our partners inside of the incident? How do we push information out of the incident? How do we get information to the incident? Information sharing, information management is huge in our incidents. If we don't manage that information flow, it can cripple us very, very quickly, especially in these larger incidents. And then lastly, a lot of folks have heartburn with the forms, uh, the ICS 200 series forms, the incident action plan, and some of the other forms that go along with that. Yes, they're complicated if you don't understand them. But if you understand those, and we're gonna break them down, we're gonna, we're gonna help you understand every single piece and part. And quite frankly, once you do that, it gets pretty easy. Uh, they're, they're not complicated at all. They're a, a very simplified way to express the plan. They're also a way to have kind of a checklist with, within a set of documentation. There's a number of different things that the incident action plan can be for you. Hey, we're really glad that you joined us today. Uh, we're, we're excited about this series. We want you to click on every single one of the episodes. Our goal is to put one out a week. We may not meet that. Uh, again, we, we've, we've got some other things going uh, for the channel. Uh, we've got things, uh, other things going on, but our goal is gonna be to put out one episode a week. If you like what you're seeing so far, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, the subscribe button's on one side or the other uh, of the, the corner of the screen there. If you're on a mobile device, uh, you may have to scroll down just a little bit uh, right under the screen and hit the big red subscribe button. But be sure to do that. Uh, be sure to hit that like button, that helps us out. Also, uh, with the, the launching of this series, uh, Incident Command Simplified, we're also starting another Facebook group. Uh, we've got uh, a Hazmat Ops Training Facebook group, but we're starting a, another Facebook group as well. Uh, it'll also be called Incident Command Simplified. So be sure and look us up there uh, and make sure that you join that. We wanna 
give you an opportunity uh, to ask as many questions uh, either in the comments here or on the Facebook group. Um, and that's again, that's just a way for us to share as much information with as many partners as we can.